Welcome to Sarter TV. I'm Brian Watson. Joining me today will be Larry Quinlan, the global CIO of Deloitte. Larry will be talking about his view of the CIO role, some of the uniqueness of his actual role as global CIO at Deloitte, as well as his vision for a technology culture for the company. Larry, good to see you. Sure, my pleasure. It's good to be here with you. Can you take us through your career journey? Tell us where you, how you got to where you are today. So my journey actually started in uh, my father's business on a tiny island in St. Kitts. Uh, 68 square miles, 35,000 people. And as I grew up, I got this interest in technology that perhaps I didn't know I had. And it culminated in me doing a number of courses in graduate school here in New York City. And actually refusing a sales job after graduate school and pounding the pavement just to find a job that had a real technology content. Unfortunately, I found that, followed my passion, became immersed not in technology for technology's sake, but really the whole notion of technology-enabled business. So my mm -hmm. first job was really uh, technology in support of an operations function, and that really excited me. And I've been working my way through the ranks. Mm -hmm. You know, they say there's the overnight success 20 years in the making. <laughs> <laughs> um, but technology has always been a passion of mine. I made a deliberate choice to look for technology roles, and here I am. Well, speaking of technology roles, you sit now as the global CIO of Deloitte. Can you tell us a little bit about how you sort of define that role? We've talked so much about what a CIO really is or what a CIO really should be. Can you just talk a little bit about what goes into your role and what some of your biggest initiatives and priorities are? Yeah, the global CIO role at Deloitte or in a professional services firm is quite an interesting one. We are one of the world's largest technology consulting firms. We are one of the world's largest uh, risk advisory firms. We're one of the world's largest cybersecurity firms, change management firms. So imagine being the CIO of thousands of people who are completely convinced that they know far more than you do. And in many cases, they actually do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not for the faint of heart, right. but it's fun. The caliber of people you get to work with is amazing. The intellectual content is stimulating. And I get to define the job in very meaningful ways. So I've been able to do things like build shared services across the entire world. We've been able to stand up new organizations, new countries. We've been able to build strategy from the PowerPoint deck all the way to the execution of it. And for that, I'm grateful. It's an environment that allows me to do really meaningful things mm -hmm. in reasonable periods of time. One of the unique things you, you mentioned is sort of living in this world where you are the CIO, being surrounded by so many people who are deeply engaged in what enterprise IT is all about, right. talking about risk, talking about change management, talking about cybersecurity. It is a little bit challenging at times. Can you talk about that dynamic a little bit and how that works in and maybe how it works to your advantage? It is challenging. You have to have a bit of a thick skin. You just have to acknowledge that up front. If, if you're very sensitive, a very thin skin, this is not the role for you. You're challenged in many ways by people who have completely different ideas. In a retail store, uh, store manager in a big retail chain doesn't wake up one morning and say, you know what I'm going to do this morning? I think I'm just going to put in a new point of sale system in my store. The thought just never crosses their mind. In professional services, the equivalent of that thought crosses minds every single day. Mm -hmm. right? People trying to innovate, do new things. Sometimes you're right there with them. Sometimes you found out about it a little bit after it got started. 
So it's not about, in the CIO role in professional services, it's not about being in strict control of everything. That's not the name of the game. Right. It's really about how to craft a holistic strategy that allows us to win in the marketplace, that allows us to maximize the productivity and effectiveness of our people, and to ensure that we can manage the overall experience and cost of technology with appropriate governance. Yeah. That's what I think about. How would you define sort of, and characterize your leadership style as a CIO? There are a few overarching personal guiding principles that I try to adhere to, not always successfully, before I even think about the role. So the first guiding principle is I could be wrong. And I try to approach it with the notion that I have an opinion on a lot of things, mm -hmm. but I shouldn't get so completely wrapped up in the opinion that I ignore the fact that I could be wrong. Sometimes I am a bit jealous of all of the people I meet who couldn't, who just don't have a worry in the world that they could be wrong. <laughs> I am concerned about the fact that I could be wrong and therefore I try always to be listening for that contrarian point of view that could teach me something. Mm -hmm. The second personal guiding principle is that everyone can teach me something and that I have to be skilled enough to discard the things that just don't make sense without discarding the person who's saying them. Mm -hmm. Because the fifth thing that they say, even the first four, made utterly no sense at all. That fifth thing could be a gem that I could learn something from. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a second principle. You know, the third principle, everyone says, you know, don't shoot the messenger. You know, in the face of bad news, I get grumpy sometimes. I, I, I don't promise always to be cheerful and smiling and welcome the bad news, etc. Right. So what I tell people is, look, let's have a deal. There are times when I will shoot the messenger. Don't worry about it. We will never kill the messenger. Mm. So you'll survive it. We'll be good. So. You talked about the idea of learning from people. And, and I remember in some of our conversations in the past, you'd commented about some mentors you have had and some, some people who have helped you along the way. Can you talk about some of those experiences and how valuable they've been in your career? I sit in the role I sit in because people went out of their way to help me. And I, it's a fundamental part of the value proposition of being a leader, in my view. My job is about people. By the time you sit in the seat I sit in, it's doubtful that your key card even gets you into the data center. Right? So there are people who know way more about data centers than you do, and people who know way more about networking and virtualization and data analytics, and you name the topic. There are people who know more about it than you do. Mm -hmm. So what's your value proposition? It's not about being right all the time in technology. The value proposition, from my point of view, is twofold. It's understanding strategically where the enterprise is going and where and how technology can enable that. And the second is about bringing out the best in people. And that's hugely important because it's not just about bringing out the best in the best people. Right. It's about bringing out the best in people. Mm -hmm. And that requires a multiplicity of approaches because people are different and sometimes people need something different from me. So it's about understanding that I've got to put myself in their shoes, that it's not always about me as the leader, that I do have to practice servant leadership at times, and there are other times I need to get out front of the organization and tell everybody, I really want you to follow. And we've got to figure out what the right solution is, bearing in mind that organizations are nothing more than people and getting the best out of people. You have for a long time espoused the idea of sort of a technology-driven culture. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? 
technology organizations, by their very definition, are a potpourri of problems. <laughs> <laughs> no one likes to hear me describe it that way. But, and not only is it a, a number of problems, it's a number of problems in a fast-changing environment. I smile when I hear other disciplines talk about fast-changing. They don't really know what fast changing is. Technology is fast changing. By the time you've learned a certain skill, it's almost obsolete. Mm -hmm. There's a new version of it. You're constantly retraining. It's moving. So when you think about the notion of a technology organization continuously adapting to it, the number of things that can break, you end up with the possibility that an organization could focus only on the negative aspects of technology because there are many negative aspects of technology. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed your laptop's going to break. Guaranteed your phone's going to break. Guaranteed there's going to be a patch in whatever email system you use that's going to make it not work right. These are guarantees. How then do you create a spirit of technology awareness and enthusiasm in a world where it is guaranteed that you're going to have all of these problems. So there are a number of techniques that we use to try and enable that. One is the notion of choice, the ability to let people choose their environment. Well, what kind of laptop do I want and which brand of PDA uh, should I choose? It's not unfettered. There's security guidelines and cost guidelines that that matter, but the ability for people to choose. A focus on the productivity of people. What are the things, the apps, the hardware, the approaches, the change in process that would make them more productive, that would save time? Mm -hmm. So we've put in place mobile apps, for example, that clearly make a difference, help people to print faster, help people to book a conference room easier that pop up and alert them under certain conditions. And this really lets people know that we care. And it's such a corny phrase these days, but no, we care. We actually care about your life and your productivity and making things easier for you. And we want you to choose because we think you are quite capable of creating the best environment for yourself. And if we do those kinds of things, like we upgrade laptops frequently because we believe people value that. If we do those kinds of things and communicate about it in an effective manner, sometimes an irreverent manner, then we think people respond in a very positive way that's different from the normal, I hate my technology organization approach. One of the interesting things that jumped out at me was your focus on the operations and tactics and your keen interest and, I would say, determination to be involved in making sure that a lot of that gets done, something that, you, again, you call the sacred obligation. Can you talk about that sacred obligation? I completely believe, as CIOs, we do have that sacred obligation to manage operations effectively because our organizations depend on this. I know there's a tendency to always want to be strategic, to leave the operations behind, and that is important. There is a time and place to ensure that we're being strategic, that we're building relationships, that we're adding value to the organization. But there is also this need for the CIO and the CIO's team to focus on effective operations. So I learned this lesson when I went into global CEO's office one day many years ago. I had my three-year strategy deck all laid out and I was really pumped about the opportunity to discuss the strategy. And the CEO's BlackBerry wasn't working. And BlackBerry was definitely the PDA of choice then. It just wasn't working and it was a disaster of a meeting. Mm -hmm. And it really indicated to me that competency in operations is essential. And it's not just a given and shoved off to the back office. In our meetings, we discuss operations. 
we look at availability of systems. We talk about our plan for you know, how we're going to make it better, how we're going to create additional uptime, how we're going to improve performance. Uh, we talk about all of those things and we talk about them openly because we think it is part of our job. Yes, strategy is part of our job. Yes, relationships. Yes, innovation is part of our job. But running great operations is also a part of our job because in my particular case, we have a quarter of a million people around the world who depend on that. And so you have about a quarter of a million people who, in many cases, are on the road, in the field, meeting with clients, meeting with different stakeholders or different affiliates all over the world. So mobility has to be a really important piece of the puzzle for you. Can you talk about some of the things that you've done there to help enable those workers? Sure. Mobility is huge for us. <laughs> you know, I'm on a plane every single day <laughs> of the week, um, uh, nonstop. There are months when I might get to an office one day a month just being on the road. We've done a number of things to really enable mobility. The first, interestingly, is just acknowledging the fact that we are a mobile organization, that some of the techniques that work for people who are at their desk all of the time with huge communications pipes does, you know, just won't work for us. So that acknowledgement was, was very important. The second thing was to provide the uh, the tools of the trade, the hardware that our people needed. So we provide everyone uh, with mobile devices, with PDAs that they can use. And I mentioned we give them a choice. You can choose an iPhone or an Android device if you want, or a Windows device, depending on what works for you, what makes the most sense. Then in addition to the hardware we provide, you know, tablets and PDAs and laptops, et cetera. We then moved into the management of those things, making mm -hmm. it relatively seamless for people. So on our laptop fleet, on our PDA fleet, you know, we run software that allows the administration of that to really minimize the amount of time people have to come back uh, to the office to get service. We can actually swap out your laptop at home. Mm -hmm. uh, simply send you a box with an old laptop, with a new laptop, you run a process, put the old one back in, put a UPS or FedEx sticker on it and uh, send it back to us. So we can do those kinds of things. In addition to the administration and security and the health checks that go along with that, we then moved into the software business, recognizing that while email and calendaring is a, a fantastic applications for mobile users, there is more that we can do. So just the notion, for example, of booking space in one of our offices, you know, there's an app for that, mm -hmm. right? You can stay from Hawaii and book a space in New York for the next day. And when you show up in New York, it recognizes that you are there and it says, do you want to check in uh, to the space and when you leave it recognizes you leaving and says you know do you want to release the space for the rest of the day and this solves a multi-million dollar real estate challenge we have but just as importantly makes it easy for the person to interact with our systems as opposed to the old paradigm of you know you got to pull out the laptop you've got to really feed the computer beast right, kind right. of thing so Making life easy for people on the road is hugely important to us. You're on a plane four or five times a week, going to so many different cities and so many offices. How do you stay focused and productive with all of that time, with all the usual sort of headaches of travel? You know, I'd have to say something contrarian, and that is I think travel is better today than it was in the past. Most people complain about it and say it's terrible and it does have its challenges but I actually think it's better today. There are just innovations in travel that make my life a lot easier. Global entry, TSA pre-check, I know we love to bash TSA but right. I think TSA pre-check is a stroke of genius. Right. Uh, global entry is the most amazing thing I've ever encountered. Uh, so those kinds of things make it easier, lines are shorter so I appreciate uh, all of that. 
uh, traveling every day comes with a set of stresses that are very different. And people who don't do that all of the time perhaps might not appreciate it. You know, for me, I've earned millions of miles over the years I'm traveling almost every day. And there are a number of things that, that I count on. First, I'm fortunate enough to have a team. And that team helps me prepare uh, for the meetings I'm going to, knowing that I'm just going to be on a plane all day. That team helps with the logistics of where I'm going and what I'm doing. So I'm very grateful. And I couldn't keep the travel schedule that I do without that kind of teamwork. Second, I have routines about when I want to travel, what I want to do. So I don't like traveling in the middle of the day because it kills almost the entire day. So the issue for me is I tend to travel late at night, early in the morning, although I'm not a morning person at all. And then I use the travel time wisely. So there's reading that I need to catch up on. There's email that I need to do. But I save some of it for thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, what do we need to do next? What's next on the agenda? And I found that travel is actually most useful for thinking. Because when I'm in the office, there's back-to-back -back meetings for 10 hours that deprives me of the ability to really think about what's next. So I actually enjoy the quiet time of travel to do the thinking. And then there are all of these productivity apps that make life easy for me. You know, my to-do list app, my ability to communicate with Deloitte in a mobile way, these are all very helpful for me. The older I get though, the one weapon that really helps with travel is undoubtedly sleep. Mm -hmm. Without that, it all goes wrong. So I am learning how to ensure that I sleep more on planes in hotels as opposed to the younger days of only getting three or four hours. You've been at Deloitte for a couple of decades. You've been the global CIO for nearly seven years. How do you stay energized and, and refreshed after, after being in, in you know, such a long tenure? You know, the cool thing about being in the business I'm in is that it changes all of the time. So my firm, Deloitte, you know, looks nothing like it looked uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I've also had the benefit of doing a number of, of roles. So I've done the U.S. operating CIO role, the global role, uh, consulting role. I spend a lot of time uh, visiting clients. I spend time with vendors. I spend time with our team. So you know, the days don't look alike. So it's not a rote job. It's not something I get bored with. If anything, I'm really trying to figure out how to maximize the time I have because there just isn't enough time. The second thing is, it's a very stimulating environment. You know, we hire really smart people at Deloitte. The firm has a gift for bringing in really smart people into the organization and I just gain a lot from the people we have in our technology organization as well as in our client service businesses like consulting, for example. So all of those interactions are stimulating to me. And I continue to learn. And that energizes me. And then the challenges we have are genuinely interesting. You know, the notion of how to enable a quarter of a million people you know, from you know, Milwaukee to Mongolia is fun. <laughs> it really is fun, really trying to understand the differences in the needs. I was in Brazil last week, and the challenges we face in Brazil, you know, are very different from Los Angeles, where I was yesterday. So that also keeps it very interesting. And then the ability to actually craft the future. You know, if you're privileged enough to be able to serve in a role where you get to envision the future, and not just envision it, but actually make it happen, right. that's the pinnacle. That's the ultimate for me. And if you can do that while serving others, while developing people and helping an enterprise to be successful, you just can't be bored. 
we're in an era that I think most people would say is uh, at breakneck speed in terms of innovation and change and demands from the business. How do you keep your organization fresh and uh, up to speed on all the new technologies that could be advantageous? A lot of CIOs are struggling with this. How do you do that at Deloitte? You know, we have a number of techniques we use for keeping up on emerging technology. And the first is just to recognize that, that it's generally impossible, that there's just way too much emerging technology for us to go after all of it. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of things we have to do to winnow it down, to understand the technologies that we really need to understand and just accept that we won't be as good in certain areas. I think organizations that just try to be good at everything end up tearing out their collective here. So we're in professional services. What problems do we need to solve in professional services? Mobility. So we just went early in mobility. There are other firms that would not go early in mobility. That's not, they could, but it's ours. Mm -hmm. So we went very early in mobility. We want to understand everything there is to understand about mobility because that's a big deal for us. We spend a lot of time worrying about analytics because that's important to our business and it's also important to our clients. We spend a lot of time worrying about the cloud and, and security because those things are also uh, important to us. But there are a number of manufacturing capabilities that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. While we spend a lot of time thinking about 3D printing for our clients, we don't yet spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about 3D printing internally. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that will come back to haunt us, I'm not sure, but we haven't seen a tremendous number of internal applications for that yet. So right. most of our time is spent thinking about our manufacturing and other clients who can use that technology. So it's really about being selective in the areas we choose to go deep in and then we'll let the press and vendors and others tell us about the ones that we haven't selected and we can then react to those. And we don't have to be first to market with every single thing that we have. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you're facing, the major uh, priorities or initiatives that you have uh, going on right now within your organization? A number of challenges in an organization like ours. You know, the first challenge I would say is globalization. The way I describe us is, you know, we aren't an American company with holdings in China or outpost in, <laughs> in Australia or something. That's not how we operate. You know, in, in the U.S., we're an American company. In China, we're a Chinese company. We're deeply embedded in the fabric of the countries where we operate. So how to effectively operate global technology is a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. We also operate at very, very different ends of the spectrum in terms of scale. So the size of the US and the size of Mongolia or Malta are just dramatically different. Right. And that creates an imbalance in need and affordability, et cetera. So figuring out how to serve the needs of our clients with technology all across the world in environments that are so different is one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to. Second, how to enable mobility in that challenging world. Effective mobility is key. How to ensure that our people can travel everywhere they need to in a very secure manner uh, with cost-effective communications, with capable connectivity is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about mm -hmm. to ensure that we can maximize productivity. How to bring the best of Deloitte to a client is something that we also focus on. We have hundreds of thousands of people but our client wants to make sure that the people who show up uh, to work with them uh, have the skills, the experience, the knowledge, and an understanding of that industry. So how we develop our people and how they get access to knowledge is, is clearly an important element of what we do.
Mm. Effective migration to the cloud is another one we focus on. You know, if you read the press releases, et cetera, you would think, ah, you just take a credit card, you put an app in the cloud, and you're done. They make it sound that <laughs> way, don't they? <laughs> it does make it sound that way. For a large enterprise, it's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. You actually have to instrument the cloud in a number of ways. There are security ecosystems that you have to extend to the cloud. There are operating procedures. There's the whole legal environment uh, that has to exist. All of this needs to be in place in order to be completely effective in a large enterprise, and you want to do it in a relatively agile manner. So ensuring that we have built out a cloud ecosystem worldwide, that's another thing that we're focused on that, that is challenging for us. Mm. The whole area of cybersecurity, you know, that's just a constant challenge. The escalating arms race is a big deal. It's very expensive. Continuing to ensure that we balance appropriately security and productivity, uh, that's also a significant issue for us. But the entire expanding scope of cybersecurity continues to be a challenge. And then the whole notion of the development of people in such a rapidly changing environment to ensure that you've got a skilled environment, to ensure that a skilled workforce in a challenging environment, but also want to ensure that the development of people and uh, the assignments we have and the leadership we provide is worthy of the people that we have in a way that ensures that our people are motivated, inspired, and that we run the most inclusive organization that we possibly can. And I have a really strong bias that it isn't how you organize the technology organization that's the most important. It isn't if you're first to market in a particular technology that determines the long-term success of an internal technology environment. So mm -hmm. I'm talking about speed to market internally. It is if you can build the most inspired technology organization where people are motivated, where people want to be on that team, where people want to be in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, actually respecting the people rowing next to them. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of organization that succeeds in the end. I know you have two college-age children now. I don't know if they've chosen other paths in life yet, but have you encouraged them or would you encourage them to pursue a career in IT? You know, I have two daughters. One just graduated college a few uh, okay. months ago. Congratulations. And thanks. And the other one's got uh, two more years to go. I would say their tuition's kind of messed up my retirement plan a little bit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's why we work, I imagine. Right. I've encouraged them to look at technology. But interestingly enough, um, they have not. And I find that interesting, and I, I give speeches about it. We, we talk about STEM. Now, one is into medicine, wants to go to medical school next year. So that's science, so, so definitely a STEM area. But one of the questions we have, I've got two girls, so are we attracting enough women into technology specifically? STEM more broadly. Are we banishing the notion that girls don't like math and girls don't like science and girls don't like geeky technology? But we have to figure out how to crack this code. And there are a number of wonderful organizations out there that are doing that. But we have as a mission in our technology organization that we have to be more inclusive, which means we have to attract more women into the organization. We have to attract more underrepresented minorities into the organization and not just attract them into the organization. We have to ensure that they're successful uh, throughout all, all levels of the organization.
So I did encourage my girls to go into technology. In fact, the way I say it is I remind them that every meal they've ever had was the result of technology. <laughs> uh, that didn't seem to impress them, and neither of them actually went into technology. But they're doing well. I'm pleased and I'm very proud of them, but still want to take the opportunity to get as many women, minorities, and everyone into technology because I think it's just an amazing field. Speaking of trying to drive some more diversity and more, more women into IT, you've talked about the, sort of the difference between STEM and STEAM. Can you talk a little bit about your, your perspective there and why you think it matters? You know, STEM and STEAM are a little different, and I can't take any credit at all for, uh, for any of these concepts. We've been doing a lot of work with some of the organizations that are involved with both STEM and STEAM. You know, STEM's really important in the sense that we have to get people more focused on science and technology, engineering, and math. We can't be entirely a nation or a world that, that ignores this because we will do that our peril. But at the same time, the notion of adding the arts to, uh, to science, technology, engineering, and math is, is important. Because in technology, we also need creativity and innovation. We also need to understand the people we serve, to put ourselves in their shoes. And there are times when completely going down an engineering or math or science track doesn't leave us completely equipped to really understand the design principles in applications mm -hmm. and how to make people's lives better through software and how to design things that are truly pleasing to people, not just engineers. So I think the notion of innovation, creativity, arts is also important in technology. We need people who can make technology sing and dance, absolutely. We need people who can code in their sleep, for sure. But we also need people who think about the human element of things, who think about the people aspect of design who think about how to inspire and how to create and how to engage not just our own people but our customers as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that does require a broader approach and some people are labeling that STEAM. So I'm a big proponent of that because IT now pervades almost every aspect of an organization and requires sure. different skill sets not just uh, technology skills. If you were going to give one piece of advice to all of the aspiring CIOs out there, all the people who want to be sitting in your seat one day, what would it be? Yeah, it's a tough question. There's so many things that, that come to mind with respect to <laughs> advice I would give. But, you know, I, for me it all comes back to People really matter. I remember once sitting in a seminar of some kind and we were talking about the differences in people. And the, the lecturer, the seminar leader said, you know, we have two basic kinds of people. Some you would call them their people person. And there are others who really like solving problems. Uh, they're not, they're just not a people person. And so he asked us to put up our hands. And those of you who are people person, half the room put up their hands. And those of you who are not, you're really more problem solvers kind of thing. And the other half put up their hands. And, and he said, OK, those of you who are not a people person, you should just go home now. Uh, everything you want to do is about people. Every idea that is worthwhile, that you want to make happen, you got to convince people. Every organization that you're privileged to lead, you're going to have to engage people. They're going to have to want to follow you. They're going to have to want to go the extra mile to make you look good. You have got to put forward a program that is worthy of them. You are going to have to engage with them in a way that inspires them. So. 
any success that I might have is completely attributable to the people that I'm privileged to work with, mm -hmm. either leading or serving or both, or working with. But everything is wrapped up in the notion of that people are really important and determine the success of any enterprise. So if I were limited to just one thing, <laughs> it would be people really matter and we have to ensure that we are worthy of the followership of our people. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks for tuning in.